Good morning. The privilege is mine to be here with you this morning. It was great. Enjoyed the Sunday school hour and sharing with many of you about our ministry in Spain. Speaking of Sunday school, I think there's a Sunday school class on church history, isn't there? We've been doing, some of you have been doing a Sunday school class on church history? Yeah? Okay. I think it might be good to have a test this morning. So I saw some of you shaking your heads. Y'all are responsible because you're probably the ones who are in that church history class, Sunday school. What I want to do is read a quote from a famous figure from church history, and I want you to tell me who wrote it, okay? I'm going to read a quote. This is how we're going to start this morning. Well-known Christian figure from the past, you tell me who wrote it. Here we go. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent... He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Should I read it again? Is that going to help? <laughs> when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Okay, I admit it. It's a little hard, but just take a guess. Like somebody really famous from church history, just guess. Luther, all right. Great. See, you could have just thrown it out there and you would have... Looked like you were the smartest guy in the room. Martin Luther wrote 95 theses that he pinned on a door in a church in Wittenberg in 1517. And the first thesis was this one. It was about repentance. There's a lot that we could discuss from this quote. But one thing that comes to my mind when I read it is the following question. Luther says that all of the Christian life should be one of repentance. When I read that, it makes me wonder if Luther thought that repentance was necessary for salvation. Now, Martin Luther, remember, is the champion of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. In other words, God pardons us and he accepts us only through faith. That's what Luther taught. But it sounds like he's saying here that maybe something else is necessary. Should Luther maybe have said justification is by faith and repentance? Well, the question becomes a little more interesting when we go to certain texts in the New Testament that seem to condition salvation on repentance. So if you want to go with me to Acts chapter 2, we're going to read just one verse. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And that's where we find recorded Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes and Peter goes out and he starts to preach. And Luke records in Acts for us there, Acts chapter 2, that people were convicted of their sin as Luke, excuse me, as Peter was preaching. And they asked Peter, what should we do? And here's how Peter answered. Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of of your sins. Does a person need to be repentant? Does a person need to repent in order to be forgiven of their sins, in order to be justified, in order to be saved? That's the question that we're going to let guide us in our thinking this morning. We're going to come to an answer a little bit later, but the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to define what the Bible means by the word repentance. So the sermon this morning is about repentance. The title of the sermon is, Do I Need to Repent? First thing we need to do in order to answer that question is we have to define what exactly it was that Peter was asking his readers to do. What did Peter have in mind when he told them to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins? Well, one way that we can attack this question is to try to break repentance down into its component parts or the aspects that maybe make up true repentance, biblical repentance. And I think we can distinguish three aspects Three things that need to be in place in a person's life in order for that person to truly repent, like what Peter was saying in the book of Acts. The first aspect is intellectual. Intellectual. So in order to repent, this is basic, but we need to say it. In order to repent, a person needs to know and understand his sin and his guilt. Now, I have another quote from church history for you. This is from the London Baptist Confession of 1689, there's a chapter in this confession about repentance, chapter 15, and it says the following, 
It says that for a person to repent, he must be made sensible of the manifold evils of his sin. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? That's what the confession says. In order for a person to repent, he must be made sensible of the manifold evil of his sins. So what's the confession getting at? Well, in order to repent, you first have got to realize that you've blown it, that you've sinned against your Creator, and you're responsible. Now, that may seem really basic, but I think it's good to mention this because sometimes we use the word repent in non-religious ways. And that's fine as long as we know what we're doing. But I'll give you an example. So not too long ago, I was in Spain and I was having lunch with a dear friend of mine. And we were reading the menu. And we both ordered our plates, our dishes. And the waiter brought out two dishes. They were very different. The one he put in front of my friend was full of barbecued ribs and french fries. And the one he put in front of me was one of those little gourmet vegetable things that they try to make look pretty, but doesn't have hardly any calories. <laughs> I saw my buddy's plate and I repented. <laughs> I almost say in dust and ashes, but I repent. It's okay to use the word like this, but you see, that kind of repentance is not the kind of repentance that Peter had in mind on the day of Pentecost. I repented of a wrong decision. Maybe it wasn't wrong, actually. Maybe I made the better decision. I probably felt better after lunch. But I repented of a wrong decision, not a sinful decision. Do you see the difference? What Peter has in mind, he's telling his hearers that they need to repent of sinful decisions, thoughts, attitudes, actions, even dispositions of the heart. He's telling his hearers that they need to recognize that they've offended God and they've hurt other people, and they need to repent of that. He's commanding them to repent of their sins. Now, we need to say a little something more. In the beginning, I said that in order to really repent, we have to be aware of our sin and our guilt. So, we have to understand that we've sinned and we're guilty. And this is an important point. We can say it like this. True repentance comes without excuses. True repentance comes without excuses. We're really good at making excuses, actually. It's kind of like dodgeball, you know, PE class. My kids are going to PE class here. I mean, they're playing dodgeball. And they're learning how to dodge. We're really good at dodging. Yeah, I lied, but it was the only way for me to get out of that mess that I was in. Or, yeah, I stole that, but you should have seen I was in dire straits. Or maybe this one will hit home a little bit more. Okay, I spoke harshly to my wife, but you should see what she's like. We're really good at passing the buck. And even sometimes when we recognize that we've behaved poorly, we're not so quick to take responsibility. True repentance, however, doesn't dodge accusations. It doesn't try to pass the blame onto other people or to external circumstances. True repentance owns responsibility. True repentance says, I blew it and it was my fault. So in order to really repent, the first thing that we have to do is recognize that we've sinned and be willing to take the blame for it. That's the intellectual aspect, I think, that we can distinguish of repentance. There's a second aspect to biblical, to saving repentance, an emotional aspect. So when there's true repentance, there ought to be also a change in our emotions. So it's not enough just to recognize that we've sinned and that we're guilty. We also should be sad. So you can tell me that I've sinned. I can agree with you. But if that knowledge of my sin and guilt doesn't produce in me a certain kind of sorrow, I'm not going to really repent. We have to explain this carefully. So the repentance that, that, that Peter was was commanding his readers to have included sadness over sin. But it's not just any kind of sadness related to sin because a lot of times we get sad all right, but because of the consequences of our sin. Yeah, I cheated on that test and I got caught and I'm sad now that my grade is dropping in class. Or maybe I did that shameful thing and I'm sad because it went public. It's on social media. It's going viral. It's so embarrassing. My reputation is ruined. Well, yeah, that would make anybody sad, wouldn't it? And I'm not saying 
that we should enjoy the consequences of our sin. That's not the point. But we should be sad in the first place because we've damaged our relationship with our Creator. Primarily, we should be sad because we've offended God. And without this sort of lament, we can't really repent. Do I sound like a party pooper? Is this, uh, this isn't good church growth strategy. I mean, the attendance at Southside might be down a little bit next week, but I won't be here, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible talks about a good, healthy kind of sadness. And this sadness is part of true repentance. If you want to go with me to 2 Corinthians, I don't know if you know this, Paul wrote more than two letters to the Corinthians. Do you all know that? So we know of probably four at least. And there's one between 1 and 2 Corinthians that was a little harsh. And so when Paul writes 2 Corinthians, he talks about this other letter that he wrote that he's, he's worried that maybe he was a little too hard on the Corinthians. He's worried about it. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he's talking about that letter. And he says that he, in the end he's happy because the letter produced the effect that he wanted it to produce. Here's what he says, 2 Corinthians 7, 9 and 10. As it is, I rejoice, not because you are grieved, but because you are grieved into repenting. Do you see? That sadness that leads to true repentance. For you felt a godly grief. There's a kind of grief that's godly, that's good, that's healthy. You felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. But listen to this. Whereas worldly grief produces death. So Paul's well aware that sin can cause sadness, sorrow, and grief in our lives. There's a kind of sadness that's good. But there's a kind of sadness related to sin that leads to death. Paul's happy because the Corinthians had the right kind of sadness. And that's the kind of sadness that we want the Lord to work in our lives too. What's the difference though between this godly grief and this worldly grief that Paul mentions? Well, I think we can illustrate it by going to the end of the Gospel of Matthew. You don't have to go with me. I'm just going to tell you. You all know the story. There's two guys who both betray Jesus. Two. Who am I thinking of? You have to go to Sunday school for this. Yeah. Judas and Peter, they both blow it. They both betray Jesus, and they're both sad. It's interesting because the Scriptures talk about their sadness. Matthew 23, 7, speaking of Judas, he betrays Jesus. Later, he regrets it. The, in, in the NIV, the New International Version, the English version of the Bible says that G, Judas was seized with remorse. So he didn't just hand the money back to the chief priests. He was sad. He was broken. He felt really sad. But what did he do after that? He went and killed himself. How about Peter? You just go back a few verses. At the end of Matthew 26, it talks about Peter who denies Jesus three times. And Matthew tells us that he wept bitterly. Peter was really sad. But later, what happened? Peter was restored to friendship with Jesus. The difference between Judas and Peter, they were both, they both sinned. They both betrayed Jesus. They're both really sad. They probably both felt embarrassed. I would go so far as to say, I think Judas even felt guilty. But there was a difference. Peter was concerned because he damaged his relationship with his Lord. And he wanted friendship with Jesus back. Peter returned to his friend and Judas went the wrong way. Two different kinds of sorrow. There's a godly sorrow that leads to repentance, that leads to life, to hope and salvation. That's the kind of sorrow that Peter had. That's the kind of sorrow that the same Peter is calling his hearers to have when he's preaching on the day of Pentecost. But there's a, a worldly kind of sorrow too that has to do with lamenting the consequences and doesn't have any hope and doesn't understand the gospel. That kind of sorrow leads to death. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So, so far we've distinguished Two aspects of true biblical repentance. We need to intellectually be aware of our sin and guilt, and there should be an accompanying sorrow or sadness for having offended God. Then there's a third aspect that has to do with a decision. So you could say volitional or our will or a decision aspect to repentance. You have to decide in order to really repent 
to leave your sin behind and walk before God in new obedience. You have to make a decision to abandon that sin that damaged your relationship with God in the first place and have the firm purpose to walk before him in newness of obedience in life. So you can see this with Peter. So Peter wanted to leave behind the sin, but he also wanted to go back to Jesus. But we have to see a little bit more here. And this is where the the reading from Matthew 3 that we've had this morning comes in and helps us. In order for your repentance to be real, this decision that you make to leave your sin behind can't be a farce. It has to be real. And it's real. You can tell it's real if there's fruit in keeping with repentance, right? Matthew 3, 8, John the Baptist is telling the Pharisees there needs to be fruit in keeping with your repentance. You can say that you're repentant, but if your life doesn't change, that repentance probably isn't real. We can illustrate this comparing two other biblical figures. So now we're going to go back into the Old Testament. We're going to think about two guys who sinned. They were both kings in Israel. They both said, they were both confronted by prophets, and they both said, I have sinned. One repented and the other one didn't. Who am I thinking of? Saul and David. All right, so you don't have to go there. I'll just tell you, it's in 1 Samuel 15. We read about Saul. Saul, after defeating the Amalekites, he did not totally destroy everything that belonged to the Amalekites. That's what he was commanded to do. He destroyed, in fact, only the worst stuff, and he kept the best for later purposes. And the prophet Samuel comes to him and confronts him. And it's really interesting because Saul says, after hearing Samuel, Saul says, I have sinned. All right? In the original, it's one word. In English, three. I have sinned. And you think, whoa, Saul's repentant. All right? Maybe there's still hope for Saul. But what happens in the rest of Saul's life? You read read on through the rest of 1 Samuel and the narrative. What does it tell us about Saul? What's he obsessed with? Pleasing the Lord? He's obsessed with killing his successor. Do you see? Saul shows by his actions that he's still concerned about himself, about getting his own way, not about pleasing God. He said, let me just throw this in little parentheses, I have sinned. And then what does he ask Samuel to do? He says, come with me and let's sacrifice in front of all the people. What's Saul really concerned about? Yeah, I've sinned, but I'm worried about the consequences. Do you see? Now think about David. David's sin, I think we could say, was even worse. So he commits adultery. He conspires to have Bathsheba, uh, her husband, murdered. And then he hides his sin for some months. And the prophet Nathan comes to him, confronts him. And what does David say? He says, I have sinned. I don't think it's an accident. It's the exact same word in the original as Saul said. I have sinned. He says the exact same thing as Saul, but there's a difference. Throughout the rest of David's life, he's not perfect But what does he do? He serves the Lord until he dies. So there's, in Saul's life, there's no fruit in keeping with repentance. That repentance is not real. In David's life, there is fruit in keeping with repentance. True repentance includes the desire to be reconciled to the one that that we've offended. And if it's genuine, it'll come along with a desire to leave that sin behind that wrecked the relationship in the first place and walk in new obedience before the Lord, the one whom we want to please and enjoy a loving relationship with. I'm going to share an example with you that I think illustrates how this true repentance ought to work. I got this, I think, from R.C. Sproul. So I'm older. You know, I used to get the tape of the month, the tapes, right? They're cassette tapes. Like, if you leave them sit on the dashboard of your car, I mean, I'm old. There's no tinted windows in my car, and that tape would, like, melt, you know? And I listened to some of those tapes again and again and again until they demagnetize. So... There's one that I remember where R.C. Sproul talked about repentance, and he had this example. Imagine a husband who has a bad day, comes home from work, snaps at his wife. He doesn't speak to her with love and kindness, and she sends him to sleep on the couch. Purely hypothetical, of course, right? Doesn't happen to anybody here. We're just imagining for the sake of the example, right? But you understand Yeah, by the way, for the sake of the recording, this is not like a godly way, wives, to deal with your grumpy husbands, okay? Don't send them to the couch. But he's been a heel, he's on the couch. What should the husband do? He should repent and he should return to his wife. But what's that going to look like? 
Well, the first thing he needs to do is recognize that he has sinned. He didn't just make a mistake. It wasn't a slip. He better not blame it on her or he'll still be in the doghouse, right? He needs to come back to his wife and he needs to recognize, honey, I spoke to you poorly and it's my fault. He needs to own it, okay? Intellectual aspect. The second thing that the husband needs to do is he needs to feel sad. He should feel sad, but in the right kind of way because the husband could feel sad a couple hours into it, his back is hurting and he's really sad about the consequences, do you see? And he stands up, all right, he gets up, but he doesn't go upstairs to the bedroom. He grabs the car keys. He's going to go to a hotel and spend the rest of the night in a comfortable bed. Wrong. The sadness can't be just for the consequences. He needs to be sad because he hurt his beloved wife. In the third place, he needs to make a decision. He needs to go back to his wife, and he needs to seek reconciliation. And he needs to say to her, I'm sorry for what I've done. It was wrong. It was me. I'm sad for having hurt you, honey. I'm going to try to be different. And then when is she going to know that he's really repentant? Tomorrow, the next week, the next month, right? So there's got to be fruit in keeping with this decision. So we can define biblical repentance in the sense of repentance that has to do with salvation in the following way. Repentance is a sincere sorrow for having sinned against and offended God. Okay, so it's a sincere sorrow, not, but it's not any kind of sorrow. It's a sorrow because I've offended God. And it includes the purpose to return to Him and walk before Him in new obedience. So on the one hand, it's a sincere sorrow for having sinned against and offended God. On the other hand, it's the purpose to return to Him and walk before Him in new obedience. I think that's a fair definition of biblical repentance. I had some help with that, by the way. Wayne Grudem, Louis Burkhoff, John Calvin. So it's not just me. Um, I encourage you to look at the, bibl- the pertinent biblical text to see if that's right. I think it's right. Now, so we've got a definition of repentance. Is it necessary to repent in order to be saved? Must you repent in order to be saved? The answer is yes. But... We need to make a few distinctions. First of all, repentance is necessary, but repentance is not the grounds of our justification. In other words, repentance doesn't make us worthy to be accepted by God. You are not more deserving to stand in God's presence as a friend because you've repented. Your repentance is not your righteousness before God. Paul knew this. Paul wrote in Philippians 3.9, I want to be found in Christ. Now he's thinking, found, he's thinking on the last day, judgment day, I want God to find me in Christ. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, not having my own righteousness, not even my own repentance, okay? But that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul knows that when he stands before God, the only way he's going to be able to stand is if he has Christ's righteousness. Jesus died, and Jesus obeyed perfectly in Paul's place. And Paul can repent as much as he wants. He'll never be perfect. He needs Jesus to be perfect for him. So do you see, repentance, we're saying, is necessary for salvation. Without it, there's no salvation, but it doesn't make you worthy of being accepted by God. So repentance is not the grounds of our justification, nor is it, and this is, uh, is, you know, theologically, uh, we're splitting hairs a little bit, but it's important. It's not the instrument by which we're justified. So let's say you want justification. What do you do? There's only one thing you can do. Give it to me, Lord, please. I can't earn it. I'm not worthy. I need you to give it to me as a gift. We're justified by Faith. Faith receives. Okay? Faith receives the gifts that God gives. And if you read your New Testament, read the whole New Testament, it only says that we're justified by or through faith. Nothing else. It never says that we're justified by or through repentance. This is important. Because faith is the only attitude that says to God, don't look at me because I've got nothing. Look to Jesus. Jesus. 
I am trusting Jesus. I believe he did everything. I'm not doing anything. Faith is the only attitude that does that. So that's why justification is not by repentance. Repentance is not an instrument by which we receive that gift. It's necessary, and I'm gonna tell you why in just a sec, but it doesn't play the same role as faith. Faith embraces Jesus. Repentance, if it's not the grounds, it's not the instrument, how is it necessary? Well, I would say that faith, excuse me, repentance is a necessary consequence of true faith. And I think I can explain it to you in a way that'll make sense. At the end of the day, repentance is a necessary evidence of true faith. If you really believe, you will repent. Justification is by faith alone. This is what the reformers said, but not a faith that is alone. You say, I have faith, and you don't repent, that's the faith of demons. Faith always brings along with it evidences, consequences. It changes your life. And one of the ways that it changes your life is it causes you to be repentant. Think of this. Somebody who's not sad for having offended God, can they really have faith? And what what sense would it make for somebody to say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm not sad for having offended God? No repentance. How about somebody who says, yeah, I have faith, but I don't really care about being reconciled with God. No repentance, that's not real faith. How about somebody who says, yeah, I'm really happy that Jesus forgives me, but I don't want to leave behind that sin that damaged my relationship with God in the first place. And a lot of people think like this, careful. A lot of people think like this, yeah, well, this is great. God will forgive me of all my sins so I can just keep on sinning. There's no repentance, but that's not real faith. All that is, is signing up for fire insurance, right? I don't like the consequences of my sin. I don't want to go to hell, so I'll have that kind of faith, but I like my sin more than God. I prefer my sin over God. That's not true faith. So you see, if somebody really believes in Jesus Christ, they will also be repentant. The two go hand in hand. They're like two sides of the same coin. In order for that coin to be any good, it's got to have both in order for it to be authentic. So repentance is necessary for salvation. But repentance is is in the same category as all of our good works. Do you have to do good works to be saved? Yes, not because it makes you worthy, but because it shows that your faith is real. And repentance is like that. Okay, I'm going to bring this to a conclusion. I want to say three more things. And what I'm going to say here is like the most important part of the sermon. So you're all awake, right? Everybody here? Okay, didn't put you to sleep with the other stuff and the theological hair splitting and all that? No? Still with me? First of all, We're going to go back to Luther. What did Luther say? Do you repent one time and then you're done? Yeah, I was sad one day for my sin, but now life's great. I'm happy. No. Luther said that the whole Christian life should be one of repentance. Why? Because until you're in glory, you're going to keep sinning. Lord willing and by God's grace, less. There should be growth in Christian virtue and in maturity in our lives the preaching of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit, but we continue to sin until glory. Therefore, we must continue to repent. So Luther's right. We sin every day. We should repent every day. How repentant are we? As Christians, have been walking with the Lord for many years. I ask myself the same question. Do I suffer godly sorrow for my sin? A lot of times I'm a lot sadder about the consequences. I wonder how much more mature, how much I would grow if God would work in me a godly grief for my sins. May he do that. That's taking us to the next two points. Second point is this. I think we need to recover the doctrine of repentance. And the reason why I say that is partly because of me. I am not as repentant as I should be. I'm sure of that. And I think in general, we look out on evangelical churches here in the United States and in Spain and just don't see godly sorrow over sin. Don't see a lot of repentance. Why? I think partly because it's not a fun topic to talk about. And so we've kind of parked that to talk about happier things. Maybe we need to talk about repentance more. I got another R.C. Sproul example. I think it was from the same message. R.C. Sproul was lamenting, in this message message that I was listening to, he was lamenting the sad state of, of evangelical preaching. This was 20 years ago or more. And he said, 
that he was tired of hearing sermonettes. Sermonettes. So sermons with little tidbits of practical advice and little anecdotes and stories and jokes that are really entertaining but don't have solid biblical content. And here's the example he gave. He said, imagine a marriage that is in crisis, a marriage that is falling apart, husband and wife that are completely at odds. What would be good for them? More than 10 sermonettes on how to have a nice marriage, one good sermon on repentance would be helpful to them. Do you see what he was saying? Because imagine, I mean, repentance, we're talking about being sorry. Repentance is, to be able to repent is a blessing because repentance brings health. It brings restoration in our relationship with God. And true repentance brings restoration in our relationships with one another. Imagine how many marriages could be saved if God would grant repentance to husbands and wives. Imagine what our churches would, be look, what would look like when we have division and, and, and intentions and factions. If we could repent for real, there'd be health, there'd be restoration. What a wonderful testimony to the power of the gospel in Jesus Christ. May God grant us repentance. Now, this is the most important part, right here. This all sounds great, doesn't it? You may be saying to me, yeah, I'd like to repent, but I just don't feel like it. Well, I don't either. You say, help me repent. What should motivate me to repent? Now, if I stand up here and I say, well, get your repentance face on, you know? Just get on it. Just do it. That's not going to help you. So my message to finish today, this most important part, I want you to hear this. Repentance is by grace. Repentance is by grace. I'm going to tell you two reasons why that's true. The first one is this. When you turn back to God in repentance and faith, what you see is your Savior waiting for you with open arms. God is a just judge. He hates sin. But by faith, the God we see when we turn to him in repentance is one who extends mercy and forgiveness. If all God showed us were his justice, we'd be better off running the other way. Think again with me about Luther. This is exactly what happened to Luther. Do you remember Luther? He would spend hours in the confessional confessing his sin. And one time they asked him, Brother Martin, do you love God? And he said, love God. I hate God sometimes. Because initially all Luther could see was God's justice. And he thought God was going to crush him. But then one day God opened his eyes. And he understood that Jesus had been crushed in his place. And that's when Luther was able to turn to God in true repentance finally And receive that forgiveness. He saw the God who pardons and welcomes us back into friendship with him. Repentance is by grace. We can go a little farther. I think that some of us have this concept of Jesus in our minds. Like, okay, I'm going to turn to him in repentance. And he's going to be standing there with his arms crossed. Like, oh, he did it again. You know? Or maybe he's going to say something like, well, why don't you just, you're not feeling guilty enough. You're not sad enough. You know, just flounder in it for a little while longer. Maybe do some penance. We maybe wouldn't say that. But I think a lot of us have that idea or that kind of concept of who Jesus is. And that is not true. We turn to Jesus in faith and he says, you don't have to do penance. I've paid for all of it. It's all, it's satis- satisfaction has been made. All of that sin that you're sorrow, sorrowful over has been forgiven, all of it. In this sense, repentance is by grace. What do the scriptures say? It's God's kindness and mercy that should lead us to repentance. Not the whip, It's that offer, Jesus, with open arms. And I know when I turn back to him, I can run into his arms and he receives me again. And it's like like David. I mean, think of David. He He was hiding his sin like a hypocrite. Maybe this is the case for somebody here this morning. I don't know. And he says in Psalm 51 that he was wasting, his bones are wasting away inside of him. He's suffering. And what happened? Turned to God in repentance and God restored him. And he felt again the joy of his salvation. See, that's the offer that God extends to all of us in Jesus Christ. He's calling us to repent. And what's he going to give us? He's not going to lash out at us. He's going to restore us to the joy of our salvation. Hope, assurance, comfort. That's what motivates repentance. And I think about Jesus that way with open arms. That's a Savior that makes me want to repent. 
And the last thing I want to say is this. Even with all of that, it sounds really nice, the ability to repent is still not in us innately. And Luther figured this out too. Because Luther's studying the scriptures and he just didn't get it for the longest time. Why not? Later, Luther says that he needed God to give him eyes to see, ears that could understand or could hear, heart that understands, so that he could see the beauty of Jesus, so that he could really understand the sufficiency of his work. So it's no accident that Luke, a little later in Acts, in Acts eleven eighteen, 18, said, Luke writes, to the Gentiles, God has also granted repentance that leads to life. God grants it. Repentance is something that God has to give. So the Holy Spirit goes out together with the gospel, with this message of Jesus with his open arms, but the Holy Spirit has to apply it to our hearts and minds or we will be hard and we'll never repent. And even as believers, we need Jesus to continue to to apply that gospel to us every day to keep our hearts soft so we'll continue to repent. So I want to pray with you to close. And we're going to pray that God would apply this word again to our hearts And that as we try to preach it to other people as well, as we preach the gospel to folks around that don't know, that God would grant repentance unto life to many that they might be saved. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy, your kindness, your forgiveness. Jesus, we thank you for your obedience unto death on a cross, your perfect righteousness that is ours by faith. Lord, we pray that you would give us eyes to see again the wonder and the beauty of Jesus, of the gospel. Pray, Lord, that you would soften us, that we might live lives of repentance. And we pray, Lord, for those around us who don't know you yet, that you would cause us to be bold and courageous to preach the gospel here in the United States, in Spain, and elsewhere. God, we pray that your spirit would go with that gospel message and apply it to people's hearts so that they can perceive the beauty of Jesus so the desire to repent and turn to him and receive salvation. And we ask this in his name, amen.